Let's get to work. Happy New Year, everyone! The Green Scorpion here, and 10,000 subscribers has finally been achieved! Thank you to everyone who has supported me for this year, and to celebrate, we're kicking off with Weapons Month 2! Last time, we looked at the Deathbringing Scythe, the Self-Expressive Sword, the Disciplined Spear, the Tactical Bow, and the Oddly Destructive Musical Instrument. This time, we have a new batch of 5 weapons to look at, and the Armory is full of great weapons to choose from. But to get us back in the weapons analyzing mood, we need something that'll whip us into shape. Yes, that's my segue, shut up. Similar to the scythe, the whip is one of those weapons that really only works fictitiously. Like most weapons, they were invented for conventional use before someone figured out that they could inflict bodily harm. The whip is meant, first and foremost, to exert dominance over animals. The most it was originally meant for hurting people isn't torture, like with the cat of nine tails or for ritualistic repentance. The likes of Zoro and Indiana Jones are what really popularized them as a combat weapon. A whip is flimsy, so you can't really block an enemy swinging a sword or a bat at you. But with enough force and technique, it easily breaks the skin and hurts like a mother with that sonic boom of a crack. And in the world of video games, where the laws of physics don't always apply, Whips can be used for all sorts of things, grappling, swinging, pulling things in, and the mid-range can give characters a unique edge in combat. So for the first list of the month, I'll be listing the top 10 greatest video game whip wielders. As usual, only games I've played, and only one per franchise. Also, keep in mind that the whip must be their main weapon of choice, and only characters that originated from video games will count. Sorry, Andy. So on that note, let's get cracking. Not really. Look into my eyes. When you're born with the name Linda Lash, your career choices are kind of limited. Now imagine it's the late 80s, you're still a kid, and you're playing Double Dragon for the NES for the first time. Billy Lee controls pretty stiffly, so saving your girlfriend is gonna be hard. I mean, the bad guys are really bad guys, just punching your girlfriend like that? What decent man goes around beating up women? Oh, I guess Billy Lee does. Or he would if Linda Lash would stop beating him to a pulp. There are only a few moves in this game and no kind of diving kick, so she can just keep her distance and cover him with gashes. With a little bit of practice, or by holding onto the bat from the last screen, you can easily overcome her. But that is far from the last time you'll see her. In fact, you'll fight Miss Lash dozens of times in the first stage alone. In Double Dragon 2, she got promoted to be one of the Black Warriors, and she made a comeback in the recent Double Dragon Neon. She even appears as a main antagonist in the movie. For whatever that's worth. There isn't really much to say for her fighting prowess, but she certainly beat me up on multiple occasions, because when everyone else is fighting barehanded, Linda Lash is the one person smart enough to bring some leather. Francisca von Karma is a professional prosecutor who grew up in Germany, and was always pressured to live up to the legacy of her father, Manfred. Being both an immigrant and a young woman, it can be difficult to be taken seriously in such a male-dominated, close-minded profession. So what does she do? Well, she studies through childhood and passes her bar exam at the age of 15, she keeps a professional, emotionless attitude in the court, and when that doesn't work, she demands respect by whipping people into submission. Whips aren't really a lethal weapon, and in the year 2018, anything goes in the process of judicial review, apparently. So Von Karma actually manages to be a very successful lawyer. Her analysis of people, her methodology for presenting evidence, and her complete domination of every testimony she examines prove her to be just as vicious as the later warriors on this list. The whip is just a symbol of her litigation style. Just as whips were invented to keep control over dogs and horses, Von Karma uses it to assert her control over the courtroom. Heck, even as a young teenager she was lash-happy. 
Now this is a list about people who fight with weapons, and Von Karma is easily the most violent prosecutor in the Ace Attorney series, with Coffee lobbing Godot being a distant second. But did you know that Francisca and Phoenix Wright were originally planned to be playable characters in Tonsunoko vs. Capcom? The developers commented that her fighting style would have been easy to implement, but difficulties with balancing Phoenix's attacks got them both thrown off the roster. And while Mr. Wright would later be perfected to appear in Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Francisca remains on the bench. So she's stuck here at number 9. Maybe that's why she often knocks Phoenix unconscious just by whipping him. Sore loser. There's a good chance you've never played Dragon Quest VIII for the PS2, because Dragon Quest is a series that is criminally underlooked outside of Japan. It's actually a surprisingly polished RPG, which follows a band of young heroes protecting a transmogrified king and princess. One of these heroes is Jessica, the team's sorceress. But there is more to Jessica's character than just that. Her whip abilities allow her to physically attack multiple enemies at once. She also helps the group by showing off her body to recruit Angelo and gain them access into different... Wait... Well, she also has the most changeable costumes, ranging from a bikini to a bunny suit. Uh, and, <clears throat> well, she doesn't just fight with a whip. You can also put points into a number of her skills, including knives, magic, and... Sex appeal? She has a skill track for sex appeal? Huh. Well, it's a good game. And at least it has a humor to be blunt about it. The game still does give Jessica a personality of her own, and if you look at her as a culmination of all the female character tropes, the fact that she is so likable is really a testament to good writing, despite her being the obligatory token girl. For some reason, the whip on her belt just ties all that together for me, but I'll let you be the judge. It's not often I get to use Mega Man characters in a list about classical weaponry, but coming in at number 7 we have Axel the Red from Mega Man X5. Axel is one of the game's requisite 8 level bosses, and while most of these mavericks are usually based on animals, Axel is based around roses. Interesting that something can be plant-based and robotic at the same time, but I look at him as the improved version of Plant Man from Mega Man 6. Yes, him. Mr. Roses here is the first dude on this list, surprise surprise. With the Sigma virus infecting Reploids and turning them into power-hungry Mavericks, Axel locks himself away in an abandoned military base, which just happens to house the orbiter engine that the good guys need to finish the spacecraft and go to stop Sigma. Axel isn't exactly evil per se, but when X and Zero show up to take the engine, Axel refuses to hand it over, as he does not care about the fate of the world and only watches out for himself. He also distrusts the Maverick Hunters for unjustly slaughtering the Repliforce in Mega Man X4. And he kinda has a good point there, seeing as the Repliforce was ultimately innocent. So the fight ensues. Axel's favorite attack is his thorn-covered whip. It reaches for about a third of the screen, and if it hits, it digs into the target and saps a large portion of their health. He also can roll the whip into a kind of spiked wrecking ball and swing it. Like most Mega Man bosses, if you have the right weapon or just get the pattern down, beating Axel is a cakewalk. But with his reach and the ability to clone himself for twice the vines, Axel can be a real thorn on your side if you're not ready. Hey, another Final Fantasy IV character! First we had Kane, then Edward, and now we have the summoner Rydia. Final Fantasy IV isn't even my favorite Final Fantasy game, but apparently it's got some great examples of weapon users. And hard players. Anyway, Rydia is a summoner of the town Mist. Cecil meets her under less than pleasant circumstances, since he kind of unwittingly killed her mother and brought a cataclysm to her village. Rydia is now the last summoner in the world, and despite Cecil's orders to kill all summoners, the Dark Knight can't bring himself to slay a seven-year-old girl. Throughout the journey, we watch Rydia grow up, both emotionally and literally. She overcomes her fear of fire, learns to forgive Cecil, and after supposedly being eaten by Leviathan, she finds herself in the Fey March, the land of the Eidolons. Time moves faster in the Fey March, so by the time Cecil meets with Rydia again, she's all grown up and a master summoner. Like mages from the Scythe Wheelers list, Rydia earns her spot on this top 10 for not the talent with the whip, but for the symbolism of holding one. 
She's like any tamer, but instead of taming lions, Rydia commands titans and elementals. She can summon her mother's Eidolon, the Mist Dragon, and not only is she no longer scared of fire, she now has a partnership with Ifrit, the demigod of flame. She even proves herself worthy to summon Leviathan and Shura, the king and queen of Feymarch, by besting him in battle, and is the only summoner ever to earn Bahamut's respect. She conquered her fears and tamed them to work for her, and after using her newfound ability to save the world, she learns to live alongside them in the Feymarch, and her trusty whip was a tool she used to accomplish it all. Now that we've hit the top 5, let's look at some real combat threats, starting with Poison. She may have been disqualified from my top 10 Femme Fatales list, but it's about time we talked about her. And before you guys start lashing at me, yes, Poison is a transsexual. A lot of gamers say this because, when Final Fight was first brought into America, some versions changed Poison and her palette swap Roxy into men. But actually, since the first concept sketches of the character, Capcom intended for her to be transgender. The sprite changes have nothing to do with it. Though they never really come out and say it, there are more than enough hints to it throughout her career. She mostly made cameo appearances after her initial service for the Mad Gear gang in Metro City. She appeared as Hugo's coach in Street Fighter 3, and was even playable in Final Fight Revenge, where she fought with handcuffs and a stock whip. I'm beginning to think Poison moonlights in a few other professions. After years of being little more than a conversation piece for gamers and fanfic writers, Poison made her return to the limelight in Street Fighter X Tekken, with her self-taught martial arts that heavily utilizes a whip. But wait! You say irritably, your mouse hovering over the comment section to make snide corrections. That's not a whip! That's like a fly swatter or something! Actually, it's a riding crop. It is used by horse trainers to condition horses to run, and although it doesn't have a lash, it is a type of whip. In Poison's case, it can also shoot range streaks of pink energy that block Hadoukens and Ninja Stars. Besides having a unique moveset with acrobatic kicks and moves like Whip of Love and Kiss by a Goddess, she also has her partner Hugo, a lumbering man who is most likely based off Andre the Giant of WWF fame. Hugo is a dangerous combination of violence and stupidity, but luckily, Poison has been keeping him in line since their departure from Mad Gear. There's one thing you gotta remember when you see this woman with a short whip challenging you to a fight. If she can control that Goliath, just imagine what she can do to you. So you best stay out of her way. Unless you're into that kind of thing. I won't judge. This next one is a little bit of a cheat, but let's look at Samus. No, not the character Samus Aran, whose weapon of choice is the Power Beam and her Barrier Suit. We're looking at the sub-character that is Zero Suit Samus. 2004 marked the release of Metroid Zero Mission, a Game Boy Advance retelling of the original Metroid. Though the controls, graphics, and level design were all upgraded, the story remained the same. Samus travels to planet Zephyrus, defeats Kraid and Ridley, exterminates the Metroids, kills Mother Brain, and escapes before the base on Torion can explode. But at the end, an unexpected epilogue finds Samus' gunship shot down by space pirates. Her armor offline, this marks the first time, outside of the Justin Bailey code, where we controlled an unarmored Samus, wearing what is now dubbed the Zero Suit. The chance to see Samus' form in tight blue spandex was less rewarding considering that her only way to defend herself was now stealth and a crappy little stun pistol. Now fast forward to Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Some characters are getting new moves and other tweaks, and Hal gets the brilliant idea to make Samus transform a la Zelda and Sheik into her alternate character, Zero Suit Samus. Well, as exciting as it is to see Samus' face in Brawl, the idea of the Zero Suit mission in the GBA game was that it was a handicap. So if they are making Zero Suit into a new character, it needs some great new additions to make it viable. Solution? Her stun pistol morphs into a laser whip. Now, I'm a sucker for transformable weapons. But the Power Whip is just nuts! She grapples onto ledges to save herself, she grapples enemies' collars to pull them in, she fires stunning sparks and follows up with a 4000 volt whiplash, she strikes through solid walls, and all the while, her added mobility from her loss of the Chozo weight helps her be as near or as far as she wants to be at a moment's notice. I love the fact that depending on how you swing, there's both a move that keeps them in place to deal more damage, and a move that knocks them back when they're damaged enough, both with similar range. I guess it's all in the wrist. 
Zero Suit Samus' acrobatic whiplashery made her extremely popular in tournaments. And while these escapades would never help Aaron in her space adventures, this alternate version of the character is a top-tier pick. So put down that Metroid timeline and the heavy artillery. It's not all about the cannon. Let's return to feudal China with one other Dynasty Warriors character that left an impact on me. This time, we meet Diao Chan. Lover to both Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu, she used her connection to them to turn them against each other. The thing about Dynasty Warriors' story is that it never really stays the same. Each game has stories for multiple characters that can lead to different endings, but come the next game, only one of those previous endings can be adopted while the rest are thrown out. So it's hard to look at someone like Diao Chan for character development. Throughout the series, she is always seen with Lu Bu, and sometimes Dong Zhuo, but her level of betrayal and how conflicted she is about her deceit changes in each iteration. And while in the earlier titles, her weapons of choice were those ornamental maces, Dynasty Warrior 6 gave her the 9 section whip, making her the only whip wielder in the history of the series. Like most playable characters in the franchise, Diao Chan is a god among men and wipes through them in droves. Her whips, called Moonflower, Sunflower, and Dewflower, make her one of the best characters for hitting large groups of enemies at a time. And though she doesn't have exceptional damage, she has the highest Musou level in the game, which is used to unleash ridiculous combos. Despite her feats of strength, Diao Chan actually longs for peace in the world, and hopes that her horrid acts of violence can someday lead China to an age of peace. Again, the most formidable thing about Diao Chan is her control over others. I mentioned Lu Bu. Remember him from my Spears list? He is an unstoppable beast who slices through everyone he meets, and he answers to no one. Except Diao Chan. She continuously convinces him to betray Dong Zhuo or fight for such and such a cause. So I guess you could say... <sighs> He's whipped. If a blade at the end of a chain isn't strong enough, Diao Chan has Lu Bu, the legendary spear-wielding Lu Bu on a leash. That? is terrifying! <laughs> Ivy Valentine has been on the hunt to destroy an accursed sword since Soul Calibur 1. Which, for those of you who don't know, is actually the second game in the series, not the first. Since her introduction, she has become a staple in the franchise, appearing in every installment since, wielding her Snake Sword Valentine. And no, Valentine is not exactly a whip as we come to know it, but given the sheer ridiculousness of the weapon, it begs examining. It can take the form of a short sword, but with a simple gesture, it extends into a razor-sharp chain of varying length. So, like Zero Suit Samus' gun, I'm inclined to file this under transforming whip. She certainly wields it like one, and to great effect. Ivy is one of the most difficult characters to master, but given time, you'll be piercing enemies through the floor, strangling them, and dealing very hard to avoid unblockable attacks. It makes sense that Ivy would be so hard to learn. Training to fend off giant great swords and axes with a flimsy whip is no small endeavor. Ivy can also be one of the best at ranged combat. Her moves don't have quite the same reach as Cervantes' pistol sword or Algol's weird bouncy balls, but she has a lot of reach moves for both horizontal and vertical swings, meaning the opponent is never safe no matter where they stand. Also, I don't want to go into the whole femme fatale thing again, since we did that already, but it begs repeating. There's a reason why Ivy is so popular. Well, two reasons. My point is, Ivy's got that dominatrix thing going and has been fulfilling all kinds of fetishes for gamers. She's a masochist. Her weapon implies discipline, torture, control, and bondage when necessary and she's always enjoying her dominance over the male characters with arrogant and suggestive quips. Not only is Ivy one of the most talented whipmasters, the whip is probably most central to what makes her character. So forgive me for the slight exception I'm making with the snake sword. It's a little ridiculous, but remember, this is the same place we got Yoshimitsu from. The ultimate video game whiplasher is upon us, but before we do that, let's recap. Number 10, Linda Lash. Number 9, Francisca von Karma. Number 8, Jessica. Number 7, Axel the Red. Number 6, Rydia. Number 5, Poison. Number 4, Zero Suit Samus. Number 3, Diao Chan. And number 2, Ivy Valentine.
actually an extremely close call between the top two characters, but in the end, I had to go with Simon Belmont from Castlevania. After all, if Zoro and Indy are responsible for popularizing the whip in movies, Simon gets the honor of bringing the craze to video games. The Belmont clan has been fighting for millennia to keep Dracula at bay. And Dracula isn't just some silly vampire. In this universe, he has godlike power and an army of gothic monsters, Lovecraftian horrors, and death itself. And what do the Belmonts bring with them to challenge such an adversary? Nothing but the sacred whip passed down from generation to generation, the Vampire Killer. With so many Belmonts throughout the series, even choosing one to represent the family was a challenge, with Trevor, Richter, and Julius being major contenders. But not only was Simon the star of the very first game, he also gets the most mileage out of this one simple weapon. Sure, he occasionally stocks up on some daggers and holy water to get hard to reach skeletons, but he doesn't have the item crashes that Richter Belmont has, or the magical enhancements that Leon Belmont has. It's just a whip and some sub-weapons. And in Super Castlevania 4, he barely even needs sub-weapons. For a 16-bit side-scroller, Simon's ability to whip in all four directions, grappling onto hooks and swing across gaps, and break through stone walls were enough to overcome every obstacle. Let's be fair though, you can't give Simon the number one spot just because he's one of the first. And out of context, being able to whip at an upward angle doesn't make him as skilled as Ivy or Diao-chan. With that, I point you to Castlevania Judgment. Now die! Know the might of legend. I can't say I'm proud to put the most obvious choice on the number one spot, or to finally have a weapons list with lots of female characters only to give the gold to the second guy on the list. Well, third. But in every era that Simon has appeared in, NES, SNES, and Wii, he has come with a whole new bag of tricks. And when he shows up, I would not want to be Dracula. And that is what ultimately makes Simon Belmont the number one greatest whip wielder in gaming history. I'm the Green Scorpion, thanks for watching. He who wields this whip is not easily defeated. Hey look! I'm popular now! Okay.